Hello everybody and welcome to the last chapter of trigonometric functions. Today we'll be covering chapter 5.5. Chapter 5.5 is all about making connections and instantaneous rate of change. Immediately with that title, it is safe to assume we are dealing with word problems, as that is what this textbook has been doing thus far. So of course with that in mind, we're actually going to be looking at the application of sinusoidal functions. So today, honestly, we only have to deal with word problems. Again, chapter 5.5, like all the other times, is a compound of all the informations we've learned throughout chapters 4 and 5. It is focused on the application of sinusoidal functions. Essentially, you'll be asked to solve a bunch of word problems revolving either around a given equation or asked to find the equation for a function and then analyze either one of these two things. So since the title was that we are dealing with IROC, you need to actually remember how to find IROC. So IROC is essentially the same thing as AROC. To find either one of those, you need to remember delta y over delta x. Again, for average rate of change, you just need to find two points. For instantaneous rate of change, it's a little bit more complicated. You need to find a point and a really, really, really close point to it. So again, if we were talking about, let's say, six hours, like the instantaneous rate of change at six hours, our first point would be at t equals six, and our second point would be at like t is equals to 6.001. And that would allow us to find the instantaneous rate of change. Next, you'll also be able to, should be able to find an equation using the four parameters. So although we already done something similar, now it's going to be all about charts like table of values so for example you will have to find the maximum and minimum points using the table then we know that a is equals to max minus min divided by 2 our c value is equals to max plus min divided by 2 we know that the distance from max to max is the period but since we're also given a table of values, it's safe to assume that all the values present are actually our period. So for example, if we're talking about the 12 months, we know that our period will be 12 months. Although it's not specifically an angle, it is still something we could use to define the period. Again, if we know what the period is, we could actually easily find the k value as two pi over k is equals to the period. Lastly, we could find the uh, horizontal displacement, and that is actually really simple. So all you need to understand is what the function is actually talking about. So again, let's use the months example. If we have a peak at seven months, for example, right? So our highest temperature, if we're talking about temperature, occurs on the seventh month, so on July, but regularly, we know that a sinusoidal function for sine will have a peak one quarter throughout its period, which would mean a quarter of 12 is at three months. As you can see, our peak is not at three months, it's at seven months. So what actually happened is that we moved our function four months to the right. So three plus four is equal to seven. That's the kind of thinking you need to have for this chapter. You need to be able to identify and analyze a function. You need to graph a function. And again, you need to understand the information that is being portrayed. With that being said, if you could do all of these things, you're done chapter five. Uh, that was the only slide I actually had out. This is the homework for today. And since our class is so short, I will actually go through some of the questions and show you how to solve them. Okay, so let's look at question one. First of all, it's asking us to sketch the graph of cos of x for the following interval. 
Then it's asking us, for what values of x does the instantaneous rate of change appear to equal zero? Well, let's think about it. Let's first of all look at the graph. So here we have cos of x, nothing we haven't seen before. Here are our key values. So let's discuss what happens. First of all, we know that we have to have delta y over delta x, right? As our instantaneous rate of change. So I'm just gonna write that. You can make variables appear differently using this one and then over here two doesn't really matter which order you do them in like i know the textbook says uh delta like y2 minus y1 but again doesn't really matter you're just labeling so for example let's look at our first point we have zero and one so our x value would be zero then our second value could be like 0 0.001, right? So when x is equal to 0 0.01, our y value is very close to 1. So then this is 1 and this is 1, so we got 0. Therefore, at this point over here, we have an instantaneous rate of change of 0. Uh, that might be unexpected for you. But let's think about what this actually means. Again, at zero, we have a value of one. So we're getting one minus something really, really close to one divided by a very small number. So that would, of course, lead us to have a value of one. Like this could be 0 0.99999. And as you could see, it is approaching zero. Next, let's look at a point here. Uh, because it is asking us, for what values does, of x does the instantaneous rate of change appear to reach a maximum value or a minimum value? So again, let's go look at the graph. Now let's, for example, analyze our other key point, a pi over two. So now let's say, pi over 2 is our first point then our second point is pi over 2 plus 0 0.001 there you go next we know that y is equal to 0 and then this value would be x is equals to pi over 0 point that if we zoom in we could actually see that what we intersect at is a negative 0 0.001 right how many three zeros there you go so what this equation gave us is negative one so what would this imply this would imply that this is the smallest we could get right because it's a negative value next let's do this uh, the second or the third key point which would be at three pi over two this is 3 pi over 2, and this is 3 pi over 2, and this is 3 pi over 2. Again, let's zoom in over here and find out what our new y value is. We're zooming. There you go. 0 0.01. If it's equals to 0 0.01, we actually found out that it is equals to 1. This is, as we know, is the maximum point we have on a cosine graph. So this would be the maximum. Therefore, what we have found is that the maximum value occurs at x is equals to 3 pi over 2, and our minimum value occurs at x is equals to pi over 2. Again, the way we did this is just analyzing y1 or delta y over delta x. Also, there's a different way to look at this. So again, if you took physics, you should be able to understand what these curves mean. So. As we go to the top, we could see that our line gets less and less steep. As it gets less and less steep, that means our speed, or whatever we are measuring, is coming closer to zero. At the vertex, we know there's no change, so we do have zero at any vertex. 
For that reason, we have these three points have an instantaneous rate of change of zero. Then when we look at these points over here, we see that it was getting more and more and more steep until it came here and then it started to slow down steepness. So since this was a negative slope, or this value here was actually our minimum point or like our minimum value for the instantaneous rate of change. Well, looking at here, we're actually getting more and more steep in the positive direction. And then we start to slow down once we cross that point, which would mean this point over here is the maximum point of the instantaneous rate of change we can get. Now let's look at question three. We have the following. The height, h in meters, of a car above the ground as a Ferris wheel turns can be modeled using the following function, where t is the time in seconds. First, it's asking us to determine the average rate of change using the time intervals as follows. And then it's asking us to estimate for the instantaneous rate of change of h at t equals 20. Well, to do a, we simply just plug in the values for t, right? Again, it's in seconds, so we're good there. We're just simply plugging in 15 and then 20 and then finding delta y over delta x for all of these four questions. Next, it's asking us for the instantaneous rate of change at 20, which should be really, really close to this value here and really, really close to 20 seconds to 20.001 seconds. So in the middle of those two values, you could find the instantaneous rate of change. Then it's asking us, what does this instantaneous rate of change represent? And well, it is pretty easy. All it means or all it represents is the vertical speed of the car, right? Because we're talking about how the height, we're talking about height over time, which same as distance over time, which would be similar to speed. However, since we're not doing like horizontally, we're going in a circle and we're depending on height, it'd be the vertical speed of the car. Next, it's asking us, what do we expect? Uh, would you expect to be like the rate of change of H to be the same as T equals 25? Well, that's pretty simple. Again, thinking about what a sinusoidal function looks like, it doesn't equal until we have passed the period, right? So we could figure out what the period of this function is. Again, what does our k value seem to be? It seems to be pi over 120. So 2 pi divided by pi over 120 should be the seconds for one period. So that is definitely greater than 25 seconds, which would mean that 25 seconds and 20 seconds should not have the same kind of slope, right? Therefore, we should get a different value for h. Next, let's look at question four. The durations of daylight in Sarnia, Ontario on the first month of, on the first of the month from January to December are shown below. Okay. It's asking us to copy the table and then express everything as decimal values. So again, we're just converting this. Remember, this is a ratio or like a fraction. So that's five over 60. And then you can put that into your calculator and figure out what that is. This is 57 over 60, etc. Next, it's asking us to write a sine function to model the data. This is very important. This is exactly what I was telling you about. So to do this, we're gonna identify the maximum and minimum points. So what our maximum and minimum point would be is at this value here, right? Because it's the longest and then our minimum is over here. Now we find that A is maximum minus minimum divided by two. Our C value is maximum plus minimum um, divided by two. So we found our C value. We know that our period is 12 months. So k is equals to two pi over 12 or pi over six. Next, we need to talk about the phase shift. Again, we have our highest number at seven. And as we know, 
the maximum point for a signed function occurs a quarter of the way through the period. So a quarter of the way through the period would be a, a three months. So we actually moved four months up or four months to the right. So we have now found our D value. Putting all that information together, we can find the equation. Next, it's asking us to make a scatter plot of the data. Uh, you should remember how to do this in case you don't. All you do is you plot your X value and your Y value, and then you keep going like that until you place all the dots. Then it's asking you to graph your model on the same set of axes. Uh, that should be easy. We have learned how to graph transformations of sinusoidal functions in chapter 5.3. So again, that's just extra practice for you. And then it's asking you to use tech, which we're not going to do. And just seeing like regression is just how close does it uh, appear to be to your function. Then it's asking you to carry out your procedure in part E, which is suppose that you want to uh wanted to model these data using a cosine function rather than a sine function just how you would do this well again as we know sine and cosine are very related you could easily use another phase shift uh to convert between the sine and cosine graphs so for example our phase shift right was that we did months minus four, which because our D value is four, that was because our maximum point is at seven. As we know, a sine function has its maximum point at zero, right? So what we could do is actually find out where, uh, how much we need to move the function by. So all that means is that we need to move seven months to the right, right? Because we had it first at zero, now it's at seven. So our new function would be cos with your a value, the same uh, k value, the same c value, but our d value is now seven. Now let's move on to question five. It's asking us to refer to the sine function that we developed in part b of question four, okay? And then it's, use, and then it's asking us to use a similar method that to that in example one, to estimate the rate of change in the number of uh, daylights on April 1st. So April 1st is at 12 or at our fourth month. So this is the time that we got. Essentially, all we have to do is again, figure out delta Y over delta X. We know what our sine function was. So now we just simply plug in the value four into it. Uh, also, since it's asking for instantaneous rate of change, we'd plug in a very close number to four. So for example, 3.99 or 4.001, and then find delta Y over delta X. Either way you do this should be fine. However, your answer has to be approximately 1.63 hours. That in mind, we're moving on from this page and we're going all the way to question 11, which is our chapter problem. So the chapter problems are usually just the recap of the most important concepts you have to learn. So this one is talking about a roller coaster at the theme park. So it starts with a vertical drop that leads into two pairs of identical valleys and hills as shown below. Okay, so we dropped and then valley and a hill, valley and a hill. It's asking us to find a quadratic function to uh, model the first section of the roller coaster. Well, immediately we could find what the y value was, right? It's eight. So that was our uh, vertical translation upward. Then we know it's upside down, which would mean we have a negative in front of the x. Lastly, we need to look at these, uh, the change in the y in the y values. So you went from eight to seven in one step, and then from eight, from seven to four, which is three more steps. This is exactly how an a value of one would behave. So we can easily find out that this equation is negative x squared 
plus 8. Then it's asking us to find a sinusoidal function to model the second section of the roller coaster. Again, find our maximum value, our minimum value, our period, which as we know here is going from 2 until to 6, so it's 4. Once we found a period, we could find the k value by dividing 2 pi by 4, which would give us pi over 2. C value, again, maximum plus minimum. Uh, divide by 2. Then we have our... Oh, sorry. Anything else? Phase shift? Well, let's see. If we're going to move... If we were to complete this, we know that we would have another top down here, which would mean we're actually starting at 0, which would mean we don't have a phase shift. Now, we have found the equation for the sinusoidal part. Lastly, it's asking us to graph your models and comment on the fit. So, we could graph both of them and see whether or not it fits. If we did everything correctly, it should be fine. Then for question 12, it's asking us to work again with question 11. It's asking us to determine the instantaneous rate of change for the function. Uh, that you used to model the first section, so at x equals to 2. So our first part was our quadratic function. So now we're just going to substitute 2 in, as well as a value very, very close to 2, and find what delta y over delta x equals to. Then it's asking us to use the other part of the question, so the other function we found, again, at x equals to 2. So, again, we're just going to substitute 2 in and a very, very, very close to 2 into the second function and figure out whether or not, uh, like, figure out what delta y or delta x is. Then it's asking us to how do the answers compare. And if you did everything correctly, you should be able to tell that these F answers are different. So, now we have to face question D. It's asking, it's asking us, in the design of the roller coaster, the instantaneous rate of change predicted at the junction of different models must match. Why is it important? What might happen if they were considerably different? Well, if we have a difference in instantaneous rate of change, as we were talking before, this is probably a very big difference in speed right because we were talking about vertical speed at one point if the speeds are dramatically different that could be very dangerous for the cars as if they were going super fast and then were forced to slow down first of all that could come up into a collision or worse we could just fall off the track again if it's bending too much and you're going extremely quickly nothing is stopping the car from flying off the track so as you can see you wouldn't want that would you so that's why it's really important to figure out what the instantaneous rate of changes lastly we have question 15 which is our favorite achievement check however we already have done this type of question before as you should know by now achievement checks don't have solutions anywhere only the teachers have them and for that reason they're kind of obnoxious to do but this question us this question asks us to make a scatter plot which we've already done then it's using it's asking us to graph through use the graph to write a sinusoidal function which we've already done it's asking us to graph the model on the same set of axes which we've done before and then for d use technology that's fine and lastly it's asking us how would the graph change if the cat breathed at a faster rate and increased the volume of air it took into its lungs as if it were running. How would it change? Well, a faster rate would probably mean that we have a smaller time interval. So we have 0 0.5 here. It would be like 0 0.2, which could mean we were like compressed horizontally. Uh, and it's increasing the volume of air it took in 
perhaps we actually had a vertical stretch as well. That is a possibility. However, you just need to properly explain your thinking for this question. I don't think anybody will be extremely picky of whether or not your answer makes sense. With this being said, we have now finished chapter 5, which means we're done with trigonometric functions and trigonometry for now. Next time you'll see trig will be in calculus, so I hope you are waiting for that moment. Otherwise, I hope you say goodbye to our dear friend. I genuinely enjoy trigonometry and I'll kind of miss it, but chapter 6 and 7 are also wonderful. We're going to be learning a completely new type of function in chapter, I think it's in both the chapters. It's called the logarithm, go, sorry about that, the logarithmic function. So you're going to be learning about log, which is really, really close to the exponential function. So I can't wait to show you that. Uh, yeah, overall, I hope you've had a lot of fun today and learned a whole new things. Again, feel free to contact me if you have any questions. Bye-bye.